Aileron, we take you there. Ride the winds on silent wings. Streak across the finish line at the thrilling Reno Air Races. Work a fast-paced radar position at one of the nation's busiest air traffic control centers. From a 732 Tango Mike, Los Angeles Center, I then make it to the alternative 3011. Marvel to the artistry of Clay Lacey's aerial photography. And climb aboard the Goodyear Blimp, Columbia. All this and more coming up in Aileron, the video magazine of aviation. Aileron, the video magazine that takes you there with your pilot and host, Emmy Award-winning news commentator, Hal Fishman. FAA Accident Prevention Specialist, Rod Machado. Aviation Journalists, Bill Cox and Bill Gibbons. FAA Airman Medical Examiner, Dr. Stan Daniels. Precision Aerobatic Pilot, Corky Fornoff. And our special guest, Captain Barry Schiff. Welcome to the second issue of Aileron. As you'll soon see, this issue, just like our premiere edition, combines timely flying wisdom with a visually exciting style. Aileron's video crews have sought out the stories you've suggested with one objective in mind, to put you there. Together, let's explore America's skies as we take off for an exciting adventure into the world of aviation. You rarely hear sailplane and speed in the same sentence. But let's go to the world of motorless competition where cunning ability to read invisible winds determines who swoops across the finish line first or whether you finish at all. Gliders stay aloft by utilizing rising air currents. In a sense, they store the energy of this lift in the form of altitude. This altitude allows a sailplane to glide on course from one source of lift to another. In sailplane racing, the objective is to run a prescribed course as quickly as possible, racing against the clock. The pilot with the lowest elapsed time is the winner. Here's aerodynamicist Jack Lambie. We're going to look at two different kind of airplanes here. They both work on the same principles, but you're going to see a lot of differences, too. The first thing you notice is the wings, of course. They both have about the same wing area, surprisingly, but this is on 80 feet of wing, and this is on 35 feet of wing. Notice this wing has a lot of little bumps on it where the metal comes together and rivet dimples, and it has a little bit sharper curve in the front of the wing than the back. The sailplane, in contrast, has the major part of the curve way back here and a gradual curve to that point. That makes for laminar flow. 
that means the air is accelerating over this part of the wing and there's no rivets, no dimples, nothing. It's perfectly geometrically accurate. Every part of a sailplane is sealed also, which isn't true in most airplanes. Because as the plane flies through the air, there's kind of a low pressure around it because it's parting the air. The air has to speed up to get around it. The pressure drops. So you'll find the canopy very, very carefully sealed. In between the wings is sealed because any leaks, anytime the air comes out of these leaks, it gets into the boundary layer, which is the air closest to the ship, and mixes it up. So we want it carefully sealed throughout. Not only that, but this sailplane has a flap that runs the length of both wings. Because sailplanes, unlike airplanes, sailplanes run at a lot of different speeds. They fly very, very slowly when they circle around in thermals, so you want to cup the wing more to get lift at slow speed. Then when they go fast, they flip the flap up on the back of the wing. It releases a lot of that lift, and so the plane can run very, very quickly. The Nimbus 3 has an aspect ratio of 36 and a total wing area of 180 square feet. It has an empty weight of 853 pounds. The full span camber changing flaps allow a stall speed of 34 knots and a smooth air red line of 134. It has a retractable landing gear and a minimum sink rate of only 70 feet per minute. The California City Airport is situated in the middle of one of the best soaring areas in the country. The Sierra Nevada mountains combine with the barren Mojave Desert to produce thermal lift to 18,000 feet and standing lee wave lift to 46,000. These pilots will be competing in three separate classes based on sailplane wingspan and complexity of design. The upper air situation. Soaring contests are held over a period of several days, with each day's race course adjusted to the lift conditions of the day. Today's weather briefing calls for a strong westerly flow and the possibility of standing wave lift created by the Sierra Nevada mountain range. The race will be an out and return course to the north in order to parallel the mountains and take advantage of the lift conditions. The length of the course is 241 miles. In order to increase cross-country speeds, no these sailplanes are capable of carrying up to 60 gallons of jettisonable no water ballast in their wings. As the wing loading increases, all the V-speeds increase proportionately. The stall speed increases, but so does the best glide speed. This allows the glider better penetration in high winds and increased high-speed performance, although with some loss of circling ability. The water is jettisoned through dump valves before landing. To verify that the course has been flown correctly, the pilot, using cameras mounted in the cockpit, takes a photograph of each turn point. The roll of film starts with a shot of each pilot's contest number and is processed and checked after the flight. Well, the differences between glider flying and power flying is that in glider flying, you have to constantly make decisions, decisions that you wouldn't normally make in power flying. In power flying, you generally do all your decisions ahead of time and put them down on paper. So you make more decisions uh, flying a sailplane you do in a power plane you know, on a per minute basis. How fast to fly, the direction you're flying in, and whether to stop and climb or not. The temperature at California City Airport is now over 110 degrees as 55 gliders wait to launch. We decided it would be too much of a crapshoot to go semi-waving it or whatever up the uh, mountains here. We'd like to try to get a few people back, so uh, that's what the current task is. Uh, El Mirage, Barstow, in return, 144 miles. You could be basically taking two steps forward and one back due to the uh, surface winds. We'll be stopping and climbing and circling, but going ne in a negative direction, then gliding again. So I think that the, the real trick today is trying to porpoise along in every little gust that you come to. This way you can maximize the forward direction that you're able to glide in. So being sensitive today to gust is the, is the key to making it home. There will be some outlandings, I think. I think there are probably more landings back at the field here of people who didn't get away. If the wind is, uh, you know, 40 knots on the ground, like they say, uh, then it's just it's going to break up whatever thermal activity is, is here.
After gaining sufficient altitude, each competitor must dive through a projected start gate 3,000 feet high and one half mile wide. The parameters of this gate are monitored from the ground, along with the start time for each pilot. Little boy, proceed. Stand by. Mark. Little boy, good start. Cal City Gate. Oscar Fox IP. Oscar Fox, proceed. Stand by. Mark. Good start, Oscar Fox. While the competitors are out on the course, let's take a look at how computers are used in the cockpit of a modern racing glider. The computer measures airspeed, vertical air movement, and sailplane performance to arrive at the precise speed to fly and altitude necessary for a final glide. The pilot inputs the distance to go in nautical miles, and the altitude necessary is displayed above. That altitude is then modified to suit the lift conditions. In this case, four knots. The computer also adjusts for wind component and recalculates the altitude necessary at any given airspeed. But not all sailplane instrumentation is this sophisticated. Well, the yaw string is probably more important than any instrument to a soaring pilot because it tells you when the airplane is flying coordinated. And you can see that quicker here than you can read it on any instrument. So the trick is to keep it in the middle, which we all try to do. Back out on course, Al Leffler has arrived at the turn point first. He needs to take a very accurate photograph of the turn point for verification. Pick out some landmark that you can tell when you've got there and you're, you're flying in a heading that will put you over that turn point. Then you just you roll up. I usually slow down and go to zero flaps or something so that I'm not doing 110 knots because sometimes if we're very high, we have to roll up almost vertical in order to take the picture and get the turn point in. Oscar Fox is also at the turn point so that other competitors don't have an advantage by knowing his position. He uses a radio code. Oscar Fox ground, Oscar Fox. Go ahead, Oscar Fox. Hey, Oscar Fox is double cheeseburger. Roger. Okay, he's on his way. Competition flying has driven me to fly much faster than I would at sport flying. I've taken more risk uh, in flying in competition, but I have the other gliders out on course to help me decide to make that risk. Normally I would not make those kind of risks without seeing, one, seeing someone else out there doing the same thing. At the airport, the predicted high winds have arrived in the form of surface winds of 25 knots, gusting to 40. Some of the 15 meter and standard class gliders which flew shorter tasks are finishing, trailing their jettisoned water ballast behind. Coming into a headwind on the final glide, the, the trick is to know just exactly how strong the wind is or what, how much headwind component you have. Al's calculations told him that he needed to find lift at the last turn point. This extra altitude allowed him to fight the severe headwind and make it back. Mark, little boy, good finish. With an average speed of 69.3 miles per hour, Al Leffler has won today's race and is the Region 12 Open Class Champion. Roger, short of the runway landing. Are you in a field, on a road, what? Uh, it looks like uh, just desert. There was no lift from the, from the last turn point in, basically, and, and usually that ridge is working quite well, and so a lot of guys didn't get high enough at the turn point. They figured, well, I'll pick up a little on the way in, and it wasn't there, and the wind was stronger than they anticipated, so they all start biting the dust out here about uh, four or five miles out. I got down to about 300 feet, and uh, this was the only field underneath me, so this is where I wound up landing. It feels like a defeat to have to land without making uh, the complete task, especially when you see your uh, competitors gliding over the top of you. 
it's quite an ego uh, deflator. Okay, pull a little bit more. Good. Okay. Bill shouldn't feel too bad about landing out today. He was one of the many pilots who had to take a truck back to the airport. Here comes the fuselage. The great Mojave winds claim their share of glider pilots today. But as the old saying goes, you can't keep a good man down. Bill vows to return again. Perhaps next year's winds will blow a little more favorably. You've just touched down from an IFR approach in heavy rain. You cautiously apply the brakes and get no response. Even worse, the airplane is now weathercocking into the stiff crosswind. Would a missed approach be called for? Can you legally execute a missed approach after having landed? Dealing with the last point first, your IFR flight plan is not canceled until you are safely stopped. So you may, and probably should, execute the published missed approach procedure. The phenomenon that would cause the symptoms I've just described is called hydroplaning. Hydroplaning results when your aircraft's tires try to push aside the standing water on a runway but the water can't get out of the way fast enough. The wheels then lift up onto the layer of water. It loses all direct contact with the runway surface, sharply reducing the friction coefficients to roughly that of a sheet of wet ice. Without friction, both braking effectiveness and skid resistance vanish, leaving the airplane subject to the whims of inertia and the crosswind. Hal? Well, suppose you anticipate uh, hydroplaning, Rod. What tips would you have for us to uh, uh, either avoid it or deal with it? Hal, I think I'd avoid runways that are very short and runways that have a very strong crosswind component to them. Okay, Ron, thanks very much. We occasionally plan to tell you about books and products for pilots that have impressed our editors. Our special guest today is not only a prolific author, he's a longtime friend and colleague. I feel especially qualified to tell you a little about his background. Captain Barry Schiff of TWA is one of this country's foremost general aviation authorities and educators. He holds numerous world aviation records and nearly every category and class rating issued by the FAA. He also is one of the very few pilots in the world with every available flight instructor rating. Barry's latest book, The Proficient Pilot, is a compilation of the best of his articles as originally published in AOPA's Pilot magazine. Internationally renowned author Ernest Gann says, The Proficient Pilot is the best book about flying airplanes I have ever read. I too marvel at Barry's unique ability to render the most technical subject completely understandable. It's an invaluable source of accurate information and flying savvy found nowhere else. Arranged in a logical sequence, each of the 39 individual chapters builds toward your becoming a more proficient pilot. Barry's book is educational, entertaining, easy to read, and will enhance your personal safety. Barry, you've joined us today to visually explore a chapter taken directly from your book. Understand, you've prepared a dynamic demonstration of that mysterious force called lift. Yes, Hal. We've used an aeronautical engineer's trick to help visualize the airflow over a wing. Even though we knew generally what to expect during the taping of this segment, when we took a look at the actual footage, some very interesting things showed up. Let's take a look. When a pilot begins to fly, one of the first subjects he begins to learn is aerodynamics. It's a pretty hazy, vague, black magic kind of a subject because he has to take for granted that what the books say is true. You can't see the air, you can't see aerodynamics, you can't see what the air does. But in tufting a wing, this enables us to visualize what the air does and confirm that what the books tell us is indeed true. A pilot really doesn't need much in the way of material to tuft a wing. All he does need is some masking tape, a pair of scissors, and some yarn. And oh yes, it would be very helpful to have a willing victim to help do the job. In this case, I have along my wife Mary, who has volunteered to do the work. The tufts should be about 10 or 12 inches apart, there's really no set rule. But they shouldn't be too long or too closely spaced, because during the stall, the tufts can become entangled, and after the stall recovery, the tufts won't straighten out. 
Well, as you can see, as we sit here on the ground, these tufts are fairly relaxed. But during the takeoff roll, as the relative wind begins to flow across the wing, we'll actually witness the development or the birth of lift. These tufts will begin to line up with the relative wind and in doing so indicate that we have airflow across the top of the wing. As we increase the angle of attack and approach a stall at a much higher altitude, of course, we'll notice that the inboard section of the wing will begin to stall first. This will be indicated by these tufts, which will no longer flow parallel to the relative wind, but will wriggle and writhe, and we'll actually be witnessing the strangulation of lift at large angles of attack. To many pilots, it appears as though the entire wing stalls all at once. This is because of the way in which the nose suddenly drops during stall entry. But, but if we look at the wing during stall entry, we'll notice that the stall spreads gradually outboard and that the area near the wingtip never really does stall at all. What's really important to notice is how quickly we can recover from a stall, simply by lowering the nose. It's just a matter of restoring normal airflow. We've just seen a power off stall. Now let's try one power on and with the flaps extended. You'll notice that the tufts on the trailing edge of the wing are wiggling quite a bit, but they're still pointed aft. This means that although the airflow in this area is turbulent, this part of the wing has yet to stall. A stall usually is indicated by a reversal in the direction of the tufts. Right now, we can see that the tufts on the aileron have moved somewhat forward. Some of the tufts ahead of the aileron also are starting to change direction. Look at the bottom of your screen. Here we can see that the inboard root section of the wing has begun to stall. We used a, a Piper Dakota for this story. Interestingly, the Dakota wing consists of two sections. The inboard section is a rectangular wing, while the outboard two-thirds is tapered. Referring to the tapered portion of the wing, you'll notice that the stall has begun to form along the entire trailing edge. Uh, this is very typical of a tapered wing. If allowed to move forward, such a stall obviously would envelop the entire wingtip something that must be avoided to maintain roll stability. Uh, to ensure that the inboard section of the tapered wing stalls first, the designer places a stall strip on the inboard leading edge of the tapered section. The stall strip on this wing is forward and, and slightly outboard of the fuel cap. And notice how it causes a, a premature stall to be triggered over that part of the wing immediately behind the stall strip. Another area of investigation tufting can explore is to determine why the nose pitches down during a stall. Many pilots believe that this is a result of losing lift on the wing. But watching the tail section of this Cessna 210 during a stall, however, will show that this just is not so. But first, we need to understand a little bit about aircraft balance. Designers normally plan for the tail to exert a small download during flight. In a way, this adds weight to the airplane and requires the wing to actually create more lift than would be necessary to support just the airplane's weight. As you can see in the diagram, this results in a precisely balanced fulcrum. In other words, download on the tail is nothing more than lift acting in a downward direction. As we approach a stall, though, the turbulent air flowing rearward from the wing strikes the tail, and, and this creates the familiar pre-stall buffet. But as we force the aircraft deeper into the stall, uh, airflow across the tail becomes even more disrupted. As a result, the tail no longer can create the necessary download. You could even say that this causes the tail to stall. At such a time, the balance is destroyed and the nose pitches downward. But for those who don't believe this, here is visual proof. Notice how the tufts near the root of the horizontal stabilizer are beginning to wriggle as the elevator is raised. The wing has just begun to stall. Almost immediately, as the stall propagates outboard on the wing, the rest of the tail becomes fully affected and moves up abruptly. At the same time, of course, the nose pitches downward. Notice also that as the elevator is returned to neutral, recovery is immediate. We also can see how the ailerons behave during rapid and full deflection. First upward, 
Notice that raising the aileron causes a loss of lift, which helps us to understand why the right wing goes down when we move the control wheel to the right. Then downward. Notice that lowering the same aileron restores lift almost instantly, which helps us to understand why the right wing comes up when we move the control wheel to the left. Finally, we can use tufting to observe the change in the direction of the relative wind during a slip. Here's a demonstration of an airplane rapidly going back and forth between a left and a right slip. Notice the brisk shifting of the tufts, especially near the root of the wing. There's another really important lesson we can learn by watching airflow over a wing. As we now know, the pre-stall buffet is really turbulent air flowing from a stalled wing root to the tail. But when we slip or skid while nearing a stall, turbulent air from the wing is directed away from the tail, which can rob you of the pre-stall buffet. This is one reason why those who've been lucky enough to survive a stall spin accident, one that's been caused by a skidding turn from base to final, for example, report that they never even knew they'd stalled in the first place. Barry, is there any other way you can visualize airflow over a wing? Yes, Hal, there are many, many ways to take advantage of tufting. For example, you could take a really long tuft, one about 10 feet long, attach the end of it to a wingtip. And then during the takeoff roll, this long piece of yarn will begin to dangle. But as the wing begins to develop lift, that long piece of yarn will begin to revolve like a small tornado. We'll actually be witnessing the birth of a wingtip vortex. Now, is, is this the kind of vortex that we light plane pilots uh, should avoid when we're, say, flying uh, behind or below a larger aircraft? It's a miniaturized version of the exact same thing generated by a 747, for example. Thanks, Barry. Thanks for that information. If you would like to obtain an autographed first edition of the Proficient Pilot by Barry Schiff, we'll tell you how to get your own copy at the end of the show. Now, let's direct our attention back to the desert, the seemingly boundless Mojave, where the unrelenting rays of the sun are harshly intensified by the still silence. The desert, outside Reno, Nevada. Vast, still, silent almost year-round. But for a few days each September, the silence is shattered. give and take, everybody is out there to do the best they can. It's a very exhilarating, a very uh, sensational kind of a feel. Pure sex. You just open it up and it goes, and that's, that's the thrill. I guess what it really, to be totally honest with you, to me it means you can do combat on weekends. <laughs> the Reno Air Races, an event hailed as the granddaddy of them all, and rightfully so. Reno is the longest running air race in the history of the sport, an annual source of competition since 1964. 1985, the 22nd National Championship is a record-breaking year, one that draws a multitude of contenders. They've come from as far as West Berlin and as close as Reno, Nevada. From Fort Worth, Texas, and Fort Lupton, Colorado. From Corona, California and Casper, Wyoming, from virtually everywhere in the continental United States. They've come to go wingtip to wingtip for far more than the largest purse in the history of the races. But the opportunity for glory comes at a price. Uh, a racer like my machine here, Digger Red, uh, is going to cost you four, four hundred, $400,000 to build. You know, you get a parts and build one. But if you want to sell it to somebody, you have a limited crowd to sell it to. Yeah, the only thing it's good for is racing. It costs you maybe 50 grand to race it up here or more. Even if you won first place, uh, it, it wouldn't cover the cost of you and your maintenance crew and, and, and everything involved in the operation. It is a specialty type of thing, you know. You just can't go and work in the 7-Eleven and come out and race an airplane on weekends. The pilots of high-performance planes aren't the only ones who put on a show at Reno. With them, they bring the crowd, over 100,000 in all, a record-breaking attendance. 
I think the races are great. I'm coming back every year. We come every year, but we come mostly for the races. We'll be racing next year ourselves. The air show's great. We love it. The weather's perfect, and I couldn't be happier. We uh, just like to watch the warbirds. Hi, Mom. Spectators are drawn not only by the world's most renowned air races, but by some of the greatest names in aerobatics. The great Bob Hoover and the Kristen Eagles are among the many top flight attractions that comprise the supporting air show. The races are broken down into four classes. The AT6 class, in which only subtle changes like polishing, taping, and seam filling are made to stock airplanes. In the International Formula One class, streamlining is the name of the game. Formula One air racing started in uh, 1948. It first started out as a Goodyear midget racers. They all have 66 square feet of wing area. They have certain angles of visibility. They have to weigh 500 pounds minimum empty weight. The landing gear has to be fixed. You have to use a fixed pitch propeller. And they started out using 85 horsepower engines. We're now, because they're not produced anymore, we're now using the Teledyne Continental 0200 engine, basic 100 horsepower. The engines are all checked to stock specifications before and after racing. And then we draw wild cards out of the group that are racing. So uh, it's... It's highly controlled. The biplane class provides the most nostalgia for air racers. Biplanes, of course, are, are an ancient breed. It's strung together with stainless steel flying wires and eye struts, and there's a lot of uh, racket that goes on in the cockpit. But I think it offers one of the more exciting forms of racing here at Reno. The biplane uh, has been augmented in years past to be a racing biplane, and those kept running away from the original sport biplanes. So we've We've reverted back to the 150 horse with a minimum square foot of wing area, externally braced wing, which provides a, a little more competition, okay? Uh, the, the aircraft are a little better matched. And uh, basically all we do is just open them up and go around the pylons. In the unlimited class, virtually anything goes. The unlimited class is the fastest. It's basically, the only rule is it has to be a piston-driven airplane. No jets, no rockets, nothing like that. Primarily the the aircraft most widely used was the uh, World War II fighters, and then we'd modify them extremely, trying to get more speed out of them. You can soup it up, or you can put eight propellers on it, or 13 motors, or whatever you want to do to it. And just recently, uh, they're just starting to get some airplanes that are scratch-built racers. They'll be in the unlimited class. There are three courses for the four different classes which race at Reno. One for both biplanes and Formula One competition that is 3.1 miles around six pylons. A five-mile course for the AT6 class, which is also around six pylons. And the Unlimited, which is 9.2 miles around eight pylons. All races start and finish at the home pylon. Starting positions are determined by qualifying speed. Positions for the following days are determined by the race speed or finishing position of the previous day. A ground run start is used for the Formula One and biplane classes, while AT6 and unlimited races use air starts. Basic rules of the race. When being passed, an overtaking aircraft cannot interfere with an overtaken plane. And the passing pilot must not pass between the slower plane and the pylon unless the slower plane is flying extremely wide. If an airplane cuts a pylon at any time, strict penalties apply, unless the cut is judged as a forced cut. If that's the case, the pilot who's forced inside will not be penalized. The pylons that define the course also help determine the vertical boundaries. A craft must not fly lower than a pilot's eye level of the pylon's top, and no lower than the R in Reno on the home pylon. Altitude limitations must not exceed a 1,500-foot ceiling. Finally, the day arrives when the skill of pilot and crew is put to the test. 
In the biplane competition, the winners are Doug Kempf of Redlands, California, and Don Beck from Tahoe Vista, California. In the Formula One races, John Sharp from San Marcos, Texas, Errol Johnstead of West Berlin, and Ray Cody from El Cajon, California. In the AT6 class, Mike Wright of Casper, Wyoming, Jerry McDonald from San Joaquin, California, and Randy Defani of Gardena, California. Unlimited series winners included Wiley Sanders of Troy, Alabama, and Tom Kelly of Fort Wayne, Indiana. The final event, the Unlimited Gold, a classic example of how pilot skill, chance luck, and mechanical expertise all work together to make air racing the world-class sport it is. Neil Anderson of Fort Worth, Texas is clearly an inside favorite. If I were going to be uh, a betting man on this glass gold race today, I would bet on uh, Neil Anderson in that sea furry uh, dreadnought. He's, he's got a winning airplane and uh, he's one of the most superb aviators I've ever seen in my life. Steve Hinton, a top contender from Corona, California, has ideas of his own. Nothing's over till the very last turn of the pylon. Both are proven pilots. Both have heavily modified aircraft. It's modified all over. We've modified the front end, we've modified the cowling, we've modified the wings, we've modified the canopy, the tail has been modified, so it's, uh, it's considerable modification to the entire airplane. It's a uh, Pratt & Whitney 4360, 28-cylinder engine. Uh, the front end is the stability end, and the back end is the control end. So if you change the front end, you have to do something to the back end, too. The airplane is a, uh, airframe is an F4U1 Corsair, which we've modified for air racing. The modifications, quite a few of them, really uh, consisted of uh, shortening the overall span of the airplane. We fared up the outboard wing flaps. We modified the air inlets for the oil coolers, metalized the control surfaces. It used to be fabric. In the uh, first flights we had, we were blowing the fabric off of them. Um, We've got some fillets and fairings on the aircraft. Uh, we've installed a low drag canopy, but its biggest modification is the installation of the R4360 Pratt & Whitney built radial engine of 4,000 horsepower. That's really where it gets most of its speed is through the horsepower. Like the objectives of air racing, strategies are pretty straightforward. <laughs> okay guys, listen up. I'm actually to try and keep that reliability up so we'll be able to finish the race. And as history will tell you, you know, most airplanes that are going fast don't go the full race. They'll go two or three laps real fast and they break. It seems kind of funny, but secondary is flying the airplane. That has to be almost second nature. Hopefully if you have a great airplane, you don't need a lot of strategy. During this brief eight-lap race, the average speed is well over 400 miles per hour. Pilots push their machines and abilities to the veritable limits of stress and speed. The risks are understood. At the high power settings, we're running over, well over double what the engine was designed to run at. Above 65 inches of manifold pressure. Normally when they blow and start burning, you've got oil every place and you can't see a thing. Last year, during the race, the Sunday's main event gold race, uh, over half the airplanes landed in mayday situations. And here comes Anderson around pylon number eight. I got a 113 and that breaks down to 454 miles an hour. And Hinton just running a great race back there in second. And it is the Dago Red. Good in Dago Red as he goes screaming by. They are coming around with it's Hinton definitely gaining. And he is putting on the pass. Let's take a time on him. You can see by the exhaust smoke coming out of those stacks. He is definitely closing the gate a little bit. And apparently, Hinton is not going to be able to catch him. It's the final lap of the final race. All eyes are on the two front runners. As predicted, Neil Anderson is in the lead. And Hinton, he made a valiant try, but just not enough. And I believe it was Neil Anderson. Whoa, wait a minute here. Oh, and he cut inside. He cut inside the pylon. I can't believe it. Well, now we got to wait to see what the official timer is going to tell us. Will Neil Anderson's lead be enough to offset the two-second per lap penalty for cutting a pylon? Here's your winner, number one, the Super Corsair of Steve Hinton. Well, I don't know.
don't know what to think. Uh, Neil was flying a perfect race right up to the end. Maybe he got his head in the cockpit. And I saw him go by that pile on, and Kevin yells, he cut the pile on, and I said, son of a gun, we did it. <laughs> yeah, we had an engine problem, and I looked in the cockpit at an instrument to make sure that it was running right. I could see what happened probably to Neil coming down that straightaway, being towards the end of the day. The sun was kind of a little low. He, he was probably pretty busy in the cockpit. It was a, a rookie stunt, and it shouldn't have happened. That was our average? 438. That's the year of the round engine, I think. It pretty uh -huh. proved that all this week. The 4360 is a pretty, pretty reliable engine. And uh, two finalists here today kind of proved that. The official results of the unlimited gold, Steve Hinton is the victor, flying his Super Corsair at a record-breaking speed of 438.186 miles per hour. Neil Anderson, bumped to second place by a 16-second penalty, still averages an impressive 429.43 miles per hour. The National Championship Air Races at Reno, Nevada. A tradition in aviation. 22 years of world-class appeal that keeps pilots and spectators coming back for more. There were no losers here at Reno in 1985. Just about everybody got what they came for. Excitement in the air. One second, everything could be fine. The next second, you could be history. So, I mean, it's just that, the thrill of that, I think, is what it's all about. It took just a second's inattention to cut that final pylon. And our cameras were there for a close-up look at how, in the blink of an eye, defeat can be snatched from the jaws of victory. A P-51 named Snoopy won the 1970 Reno Unlimited Gold event. At the controls was Clay Lacey, who went on to almost single-handedly revolutionize aerial photography. Let's join Corky Fornoff, who's now visiting Clay. Clay, you know, I know you've won a lot of races, a uh, jet race from London to Vancouver, British Columbia, the St. Louis Air Race uh, in tournament. Uh, but the one we want to hear about is the air races at Reno. First, let me uh, tell you that uh, I had the second fastest airplane uh, in 1970. Dale Greenemeyer had the fastest airplane there, his Bearcat. And I had the second fastest airplane. And unfortunately for Daryl, uh, the uh, luck or misfortunes that can happen in racing, his uh, landing gear didn't come all the way up. And uh, so when that happened, and he was staggering around. I felt I felt yeah. I had it made to win. And uh, uh, by the time we got to the last lap, your question, I was well ahead by uh, half a lap uh, ahead of Mike Loning, who was running behind me. And it was a great feeling. I knew I had it made. And finally, uh, as someone said, the bridesmaid becoming a bride, I guess. And uh, it was a good feeling. Clay, how many total hours do you have, and how many different type ratings? Well. I've uh, spent a great deal of my time flying, as you know, Corky, but I have uh, well over 35,000 hours, and uh, I have uh, 24 type ratings and, uh, on my ATR and different airplanes, and of course I'm seaplane rated and helicopter rated and glider. But I started uh, with United over 34 years ago uh, flying the DC-3, co-pilot on the DC-3, and I've had the opportunity to fly most of the airplanes that they've uh, uh, operated uh, since 1952 until present. What about Clay Lacey Aviation? Well, Corky, I started Clay Lacey Aviation uh, after uh, Bill Lear sold uh, Learjet to Gates and uh, the distributorship I was involved with uh, was sold to Gates. I loved the little Learjet so much that I wanted to stay involved with it and keep flying it, so I started a charter service with uh, one airplane. Five years ago, I started into this FBO operation with the hangars and fuel service. Uh, we have an all-turbine facility here, as you know, and uh, we have jet maintenance. But along the way, something I'd been doing all along was aerial photography since the Lear first came out, and it was the first airplane that went fast enough to uh, be able to chase the jet airliners and also military jets. And that's still uh, a, a real big part of our business, and it's the part that I'm personally the most involved with is the Astrovision. And of course, the Lear makes a great little platform for Astrovision because you can put the whole crew in it, the camera crew, all the equipment, take off, go to Europe, and you're self-contained. You can just keep filming until you run out of uh, film or gasoline one. Clay, you know, we've all seen the beautiful airline commercials that you've made with the Astrovision. Why don't you tell us about those, how they're set up and how you do them? 
Well, Corky, as you know, we've been doing commercials uh, since about 1965 when the Lear first came out, but it was Astrovision that's really revolutionized aerial photography. And Astrovision was developed by Continental Camera Systems uh, right here in Van Nuys. And we have a pressurized uh, port that's built into the aircraft, and then into this port we put the Astrovision system, the lens system, which is a relay lens system on its own. The camera, which can be a movie camera or a still camera, looks into one side of the system. On the other side, we have the video camera, which feeds a signal from the system to the console. The system is capable of panning 360 degrees and tilting 46 degrees. Uh, we can use, we have one system out of the bottom of the aircraft and one out of the top of the aircraft uh, if you required it. And we also have another system that goes out of the nose. The whole system is controlled by this console uh, where the cameraman has, he can watch everything that's happening uh, on the video screen. He can control his camera on off speed, his f-stop, uh, the speed of his pan, the speed of his tilt. Clay Lacey is watching a video monitor, the same as what the cameraman is operating uh, here, so that they're both looking at the subject aircraft together. The airplane acts as a uh, boom, you might say, like uh, in uh, a studio where the camera can only shoot from the angle that the camera is positioned, and that's what I do with the Learjet. I know in the commercials that you and I have shot for the Japanese and then the Octopussy movie, uh, the James Bond movie, that you took control of all the direction once we were in the air, as far as where everybody was placed and how the cameraman uh, shot the film and what he was actually shooting for. And I know I just took directions from you and everything came out beautifully. Well, you have to do that. One person has to be in charge, as you well know, and uh, as a pilot director, uh, for several reasons, to get the shot we want, and also from a safety aspect, why I usually conduct the entire uh, briefing and set it up, as we've done many times. Now, I know also the military stuff. Is that done the same way? Yes, the military, uh, astrovision, of course, the Learjet and the ability to keep up with these airplanes. And of course, I don't mean at full speed, but uh, the ability to operate around 300 knots. Uh, they'll all fly comfortably at 300 knots. So we do uh, every military commercial, as far as I know. You know, when you're shooting a movie, as you well know, because you've done a lot of it, the, you're dealing with a small piece of sky, a piece of sky out here that's maybe five, 600 feet wide and 300 feet high, and all this action has to happen in this piece of sky. And uh, usually when you come on, an, on, on a military base like uh, uh, Miramar, where we did uh, Top Gun, uh, the pilots uh, have all talked it over about how they're going to make this a real exciting scene, and they've got a giant dogfight plan. So the first thing we have to do is uh, set the pilots down and uh, uh, talk to them and tell them, hey, we're going to do this just like uh, a World War I movie. It's going to be like uh, the Red Baron, so that when it's all cut together, it'll look like this big dogfight that takes place over miles and miles of sky, but we're really doing it in a little area. He's rolling out. Break left now. Break left. There he goes, popping up. Watch him. Roger, I passed him. He's on my tail. Six o'clock, crossing over. Run him now, run it. Now, Jake Hard, Jake Hard. I'm tracking, he's in my sights. Roger, confirmed it. Mission completed. Roger, let's go. You've just recently done some outstanding footage on the F-20 Tiger Shark. Can you tell us about that? How, did, how was that accomplished? Well, the F-20 is a great airplane, and it's very maneuverable, and, of course, it's being flown by the uh, Northrop test pilots, and uh, so it's quite easy to work with the Tiger Shark. We've had three occasions to fly with the Tiger Shark. Also, we've done many jobs with the SR-71. We've also uh, have footage of uh, the SR-71 and the TR-2 together, the only time they've ever flown together.
with the safety record that you've had with the airplane and, and the job that it's done, is you, have you ever had any problems with it? Well, it's, Lear's a fantastic little airplane and, and very reliable, but I did have one problem. I was over in France doing some work with Airbus, and uh, in the afternoon when we took off, I took off ahead of him so I could pick him up, do a quick circuit of the field and pick him up on takeoff. And, we usually point the camera backwards and just watch our gear come up uh, for no reason and, and another reason so that the nose gear doesn't kick up a rock on the camera. And I see the gear coming up and I think, wow, something doesn't look right. I could see the gear was twisted, so we put it back down again and we decided to uh, have them lay a little foam on the runway and I figured if I could put that wheel in the foam for lubrication and make it slide along, if it cocked a full 90 degrees, it wouldn't tear the gear off, and try and keep the other wheel on dry pavement and nose wheel on dry pavement to keep this thing going straight. And anyway, I'm not sure that it was any magical thing that we did or uh, whether that was the only idea, but it worked, uh, worked out anyway that the gear did straighten up until it got quite slow and finally went into shimmy and we were able to reinstall a bolt back in the uh, scissors and uh, be underway about an hour later. And so we just lost about three hours out of our day. Well, Clay, it's been a pleasure working with you. I'm sure our viewers enjoyed it. Corky, always good to see you. Come out to California anytime. I'm ready. Thanks, Corky, and thank you, Clay. We all know that a picture is worth a thousand words, so let's sit back and enjoy the artistry and skill of Clay Lacey. Do you think ARSAs are simply TCAs in disguise? Or can the nation's air traffic control plan really make mid-air collisions a thing of the past? Whatever your opinion, one thing is sure. Recent airspace rule changes are prompting pilots and controllers to get better acquainted. But who are these denizens of darkened rooms, peering at eerie green crystal balls? Airplanes being fed into that airspace from Los Angeles, Orange County, Van Nuys, Burbank. And I'll say at 7.30 in the morning, it gets pretty busy. You can get very easily, at one time, talk from 15 to 20 airplanes. And it's a small piece of airspace. Are they power-hungry policemen? Center Victor, Los Angeles Center. Baker, shout out. Simeter 3012. Have an amendment to your routing advice and ready to copy. Three, contact Los Angeles Center, 127.1. For everyday men and women dedicated to air safety. Los Angeles 343, 
We took our cameras inside a major air route traffic control center to learn how pilots can help the system run smoother. One unanimous request was for efficient call-ups. The kinds of information that a controller needs when on initial call-up is, of course, the call sign and the altitude, always the altitude. Uh, that simply verifies that our equipment is copying their mode C correctly or that we have the proper report in the uh, database if they do not have mode C reporting. A lot of times uh, they'll check on with their call sign and if we're busy I've got to go back and ask them for their altitude and it can take 15-30 seconds of my time which I may not have. Masked by the calmness of routine communications, it's not unusual for the workload to be very intense with controller time at a premium. From a 732 The controller's autopilot is a computerized digital radar system. It's a hungry monster that requires continual updating. The computer outputs key information to the radar display in a three-line data block tracking each target. The top line is the call sign, shown here as Aileron's own airplane, Aileron 1. LA Center's Aileron 1 with you, sir. The second line shows altitude information. 81 is 8,100 feet. That's the altitude the aircraft is actually at. And around on this side, 1, 2,000 is the assigned altitude of the aircraft. This number here, 389, is a computer identification number that is simply used for uh, making computer entries. And this uh, part of the data block here alternates between the sector that's controlled, sector 4, and the ground speed of the aircraft, which is at 120 knots at this time. The position of the airplane is actually right here. This is the target itself. And this line coming from the target up to here is called the vector line. And it, it's a five mile line from here to here is five miles. And it also, also shows the uh, relative to direction of the uh, aircraft. In this particular instance, it's uh, northwest bound towards uh, the Gorman Vortex. The FAA is proud of its much heralded conflict alert system. The reason he's flashing is because the computer is uh, indicating that uh, there's possible conflict with this aircraft over here. We'll take a look at. This call sign is uh, NALO 584, but we see that the uh, aircraft is on top. And on top to a controller means that uh, he's still IFR, but this aircraft, NALO uh, 584, is providing his uh, own separation with the terrain and with the other aircraft. He's basically uh, following the VFR flight rules. At this point, they stop flashing for uh, one of two reasons. Either the computer believes that they're no longer uh, in conflict or the uh, controller has stopped the conflict alert manually. Aileron 1, thank you, sir. In spite of the radar environment, we do use altitude separation. And when a pilot deviates from that altitude, uh, that's the most serious kind of mistake that they can make. Probably one of the most uh, important things that pilots can realize is that uh, simply because they're uh, on an IFR flight plan talking to the center or even a VFR flight plan being followed uh, by the center controller, it's still their responsibility to uh, be vigilant and look for other traffic. And there's some times when airplanes are flying without transponders on and it's possible that uh, that aircraft wouldn't, would not even show up on the radar. And uh, we've had airplanes say that they had an airplane go right underneath them and they complain that we hadn't issued traffic. Well, in many cases, we never see that airplane. The dash line you see here is the sector boundary. Currently, Aileron 1 is in sector 4. It's been handed off to sector 3. And in a second, you'll see the data block switching from 110 knots ground speed to 03, which indicates that sector 3 has the handoff on the aircraft. Okay, a handoff can be made by two means. One is manual handoff. That's where I would call you up and I would say, well, here's an airplane, which would be a target on radar. And, and we would agree in this coordination that that is the target. And I said, well, here's a radar handoff. Aileron 1, contact Los Angeles Center 127.1. Good day. Uh, three, yeah. Atlanta, 
L11 Los Angeles Center Roger. Bakersfield L Timbers 3011. The computer also can be used to communicate a handoff by simply punching in the aircraft's ID along with the receiving sector's number. The new sector number will now blink, preceded by an H, still alternating with the ground speed. When the receiving controller keys in acknowledgement of the handoff, an O replaces the H and the blinking ceases. At this point, the airplane is talking to sector three. The controllers don't wait until the airplane crosses the, uh, into the next sector's uh, airspace. They'll turn the airplane over as soon as the uh, airplane has been separated from all the other traffic that is in the uh, last controller's airspace. So in other words, the Sector 4 controller now has uh, separated Aileron 1 from any other traffic he has. And so now it's the Sector 3's, uh, 3 controller's responsibility to separate Aileron 1 from uh, his traffic. Consensus was unanimous regarding the difficulties of confirming accurate clearances. If I could talk to a pilot on an individual basis, the one thing that I would probably emphasize the most is that they be attentive when they're being worked by air traffic control, that they be prepared with paper and pencil to copy clearances, that they have the sectional out for the area that they're going through. We issue clearances to pilots and we have to be uh, cautious that uh, we get the read back correctly and a lot of times the pilots are a little sloppy in, uh, in their uh, attentiveness to uh, what we're saying and they'll read back a clearance wrong and if we don't catch it then we've got a serious problem. As you give a clearance to a, a pilot and he says okay well I got that clearance well that's not good enough for me because I don't know what he's got unless he tells me. Clearly words like inattentive and sloppy only stress the need to invite controllers to fly along with us and gain some first-hand experience at what single pilot IFR is really about. Aileron 1, what was that assigned altitude, sir? Roger. Aileron 1, climate maintain 12,000 when leaving 10,000. Proceed direct. Bakersfield rest of route unchanged. I would emphasize that even though it's important for a pilot to be attentive, if they didn't understand something, not to be afraid to question the clearance. Weather being painted on the radar scope is probably the most misunderstood pilot request. Because the controller's display is a computer-drawn mosaic, most weather detected by the primary radar is automatically suppressed to reduce clutter. The controller sees only the heaviest weather and frequently needs to suppress even this. Because of the mosaic situation, it's a computerized display of the weather and it's not accurate. It's simply informational on our part and we're no longer able to accurately vector aircraft around uh, cloud formations and unless there's very heavy precipitation in that cloud formation we aren't even aware that it's there. Pilot reports from other aircraft negotiating an area of bad weather often are the most useful tool the controller has. Most controllers I feel are very uh, good at uh, alerting pilots to what they can expect up ahead from pilot reports or SIGMETs and AIRMETs and uh, overall I think a pilot uh, flying in our system would have a fairly good idea of uh, what they can expect as far as weather. Other services are also available. Workload permitting a, a pilot as opposed to going off frequency to uh, call a flight service station can ask a controller for the local weather and it's a simple process to uh, bring that uh, information up in front of the controller and. Uh, read it off of a sequence report to the pilot. But the pilot should be aware of some of the limitations. A lot of pilots will ask the controller what the ground speed is, and sometimes there's a hesitancy, and the reason for that is because they'll look at the data block, and one second will show the ground speed, and the next update or so, it'll go to, it'll show that Sector 3 has control of the uh, aircraft. And if, an, if a pilot asks for his ground speed at that particular point and the controller can't read it, give it to him, there may be a 15 second or so pause before uh, he can come back. Aileron 1, Los Angeles Center. Bakersfield, altimeter 3011. Aileron 1 is about uh, 15 miles south of the Bakersfield VOR. And once again, the uh, controller is about to issue traffic to uh, Aileron 1 in regards to Raven 4-4. You see, Raven 4-4 is also being worked by the Sector 3 controller. That aircraft is at 11,000 feet and relatively opposite direction to Aileron 1. At this point, Aileron 1 would be issued traffic at uh, 1 o'clock, 5 miles, opposite direction. And the type of Raven 4-4 uh, is a C-47. 
At the same time, Raven 4-4 would be issued traffic at uh, his uh, 1 to 2 o'clock, three miles now opposite direction, aileron 1, which is a uh, Cessna 210, of course, at 1 2000. As far as separation standards go, in the center environment, five miles, which once again is from the, the actual uh, position of the aircraft to the end of the vector line, that's five miles. Aileron 1 has to be kept five miles apart from all other aircraft or a thousand feet above or below another aircraft. Aileron 1, previously the traffic, one o'clock, four miles southeast bound at 1 1000. Aileron 1, I have that traffic, thank you. All right then. Raven 4 4, Centurion now is one o'clock and two miles northwest bound at 1 2000. Job related stress was one complaint having a major role in the infamous 1981 strike. We asked the controllers how stress affected them under present working conditions. In any other job or many other jobs, you can simply not write the letter that's maybe uh, necessary or not go to the meeting or whatever. But we don't have any control over that. We simply have to work whether we really feel like it or not. Remember, Julia, 501, Roger, 1, 6, Contact Oakland Center on 353, 48. Coach 2 1, Los Angeles Center, Baker Sailed Altimeter, 3012. PSA 603, Quid Direct, Porterville, Altitude, Arrival, Fresno. I'm still young and I don't feel the effects of my body yet, but I know some of the older guys uh, who are, you know, been here 20, 25 years, they, they're, the stress does affect them a little bit. It's like putting water in a balloon. Pretty soon that balloon fills up, you know. That's when I normally take a couple of days off. It's very subtle. It's not like I had originally expected or anticipated from years ago. But on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, the adrenaline level, the energy level goes up and down uh, many times. And it's more than the average person, I would say. Not exclusive, but more than the average person. And this does cause a physical strain on the body. People, controllers have to learn how to manage that and how to deal with it. In my case, it's been accelerated a little bit because um, of the 1981 strike and the long hours that we have in required to work. One controller sums up how he views his job. As one older controller said once before that safety is our only product and uh, that's how I view my job is providing safety for the flying community. Okay, they should have him. They have him. Yeah. Uh, they're okay, as long as they're aware they of what's going on. Air California 217 contact Los Angeles Center on 133.05. You know how working on this segment made me realize some very important things. The more we know about the air traffic system, the better pilot we can become. Also, it helped me gain a deeper appreciation of the skill and professionalism most controllers displayed. Rod, I understand there are some new regulations concerning the use of transponders in controlled airspace. Uh, what, what can you tell us about this? If there isn't a cloud in the sky and the visibility is unlimited, does the area between these blue and magenta fades on this sectional chart have any practical significance for you? Prior to a recent change in the FARs, the answer would have been no. But these symbols outline controlled airspace. The FA now requires that your transponder, if installed, be on and reporting mode C when operating in controlled airspace. That means you'll need to pay attention to these symbols even when the weather is severe clear. The rule also applies to this area, the control zone. The simple solution, of course, is to routinely turn your transponder on, set it to code 1200, and forget it. Hal? It's time now for a medical minute with Dr. Stan Daniels. Stan, how close are the FAA's blood pressure tolerances during a medical examination? Hal, it varies with age. At age 25, it's 140 over 88 but rises to 160 over 98 at age 55. Even if you test slightly above these limits, the FAA may still issue a medical if your EKG, chest x-ray, and biochemical tests are normal. Well, Stan, could my blood pressure be abnormally elevated, uh, for example, on the day that I go to take the medical? It's common for a pilot to experience an elevated blood pressure, especially if his career depends on the medical. Most examiners are aware that stress might be a factor and will take multiple readings until they are satisfied that they have your true resting blood pressure. You can help too. Get a good night's rest. Restrict coffee consumption, avoid salt, and don't argue with your boss, your wife, or your girlfriend. 
Can medications be used to control blood pressure? Yes, Hal, providing the lab tests are normal and the medication is one of these FAA approved diuretics and beta blockers. Your letters about our premiere edition clearly reflected your interest in Loran C. Bill Givens, author of a best-selling book on the subject, brings us a more detailed examination of this remarkable navigation system. While Bill is supposed to be talking about navigating airplanes, we can't help but ask why he's surrounded by boats. Thanks, Hal. You might be wondering why I'm down at the harbor to talk about navigating airplanes. To be specific, we're here to talk about a device that was invented for both marine and aerial navigation during World War II. This is the Loran Sea Room of a Navy ship. It took all of this equipment to read the Loran Sea signal, interpret it, and transfer it onto a chart like this. Today, this little black box does everything that all that equipment used to do and much more. This is an aircraft Loran Sea receiver, and we're going to show you how it has brought general aviation into the computer age. Once a little more than a fancy navigational device, the Loran C receiver has matured in just a couple of years to become a full-fledged flight management system. Just take a look at some of the new features touted at the recent convention of the Aircraft Electronics Association. We have the smallest general aviation unit in the market. We've taken as many of the features as you can and try to make them as automatic as possible. We've entered all the data for latitude, longitude, and additional information as we'll see into the unit's memory so it can be easily pulled out. Faced with the multitude of Loran C choices, how do you make an intelligent purchase? To discuss Loran C further, I caught up with George Ledane, the advanced avionics specialist for the FAA at IFR Avionics at the Van Nuys Airport. Many pilots are concerned about IFR capability. How much use can we get from our Loran C receiver in the IFR environment? Well, pilots really should be able to enjoy all the benefits of IFR Loran C system can provide. IFR en route operation with Lorancy is permitted now when the system and the installation is FAA approved. A flight manual supplement is also required for all IFR approvals. And in addition, an alternate means of navigation. Typically a VOR or VOR DME is required. The mid-continent gap is another aspect of Lorancy navigation that causes concern. Lorancy transmitters were originally placed to provide signals for offshore marine navigation. Since there aren't many ships on the Great Plains, the signal in the middle of the country is weak, often non-existent. So Loran C may be used IFR only in areas where there's a strong, reliable signal. Some units can cross the gap using skywaves to obtain their position information, calling it an extended range feature, but they must be used VFR only. George, are there any plans to close the gap? Bill, it's hard to say if or when it will be closed. However, the FAA considers closing the Mid-Continent Gap a very high priority safety issue, and the funds to accomplish it have been requested in the fiscal year 87 budget, specifically some $43 million for five new ground stations has been requested. Bill, what is this a Navstar global positioning system that I've been hearing so much about? GPS is a navigational network using a constellation of 18 orbiting satellites which will broadcast positioning signals. The Navstar system is expected to be operational during the next decade, providing navigation information accurate to 16 meters for military purposes, 100 meters for civilian use. Uh, George, will the Navstar system make the Loran Sea obsolete in the next few years? No, not at all. The current federal radio navigation plan includes maintaining the existing 26 U.S. and Canadian Loran Sea facilities through the year 2000. That means we should be able to enjoy the benefits of Loran C for at least another 14 years. George, when GPS becomes operational, will there be a wholesale changeover of the entire domestic air navigation system? No, not immediately. The phase out of the VOR, DME, TACAN, Omega, and Loran C systems will be orderly and will allow adequate time for the user community to make a safe transition. 
Thanks, George, for providing us with this helpful information. It was a pleasure. Bill, I understand why IFR is not feasible in the mid-continent gap. Well, what about those of us who rarely fly in that area, and how can we gain the capability to use Loran C in IFR conditions? Well, you'll have to buy a receiver that's certificated for IFR. Right now, that would have to be the Foster LNS-616, the RNAV R40, or tomorrow's Apollo Model 612, which they call their standard flybrary, is presently undergoing IFR certification procedures. There are also some other factors you must think about. For one, Loran C radios are vulnerable to precipitation static, that electrical corona that builds up when you fly through precipitation. You can have a temporary loss of signal, and the unit might take a few minutes to reinitialize and rethink its position. And that's a long time to be without navigation signals in IFR conditions. Also, there are only 26 Loran C transmitters on the entire North American continent, as opposed to thousands of VORs and NDBs. Loss of the signal from any one of the Loran C transmitters due to power outages, maintenance, or even acts of God could cause serious IFR navigation problems. It seems to be a fair amount of work to program all those waypoints into a Loran C unit. Is anything coming along to make this job easier? It's here already, Hal. One of the more exciting developments in Loran C is pre-programmed waypoints. Tomorrow led the way when they brought out their Model 612 called the Flybrary. It's now been updated and called the Continental Flybrary. Just look at some of the information you can retrieve from the unit's memory bank. The unit will automatically give you the coordinates of all public use airports in the contiguous United States, all other airports with hard surface runways 2,500 feet or more, all VORs, and all public use heliports and seaports. Additionally, you can program up to 100 waypoints of your own. These can be used to mark the location of anything you wish, from the grass strip on your family farm to a mountaintop you have to avoid on a regular run. You can also use them to set up a series of boundary markers when you want to sidestep a TCA or an ARSA. RNAV's new R21 is loaded with an impressive amount of flight management data. The R21 not only gives you the location of all public use airports in the contiguous United States, it also includes Canada and Alaska. Along with location, it will read out the ATIS and tower or UNICOM frequencies, the field elevation, the runway length, type of runway lighting, and whether or not there's a published IFR approach. It's also programmed with the location and frequencies of all VORs and NDBs in the United States, Canada, and Alaska. To make it easier to locate the waypoints that you program, the receiver merges them with the existing waypoints and sorts them alphanumerically. Also, RNAV software even includes a computerized topographical map of the entire United States. It's like having an entire flight bag full of sectionals on a computer chip. With all of this chart type information stored in software, we're going to have to be concerned about keeping it current if we're going to use the Loran C unit for IFR navigation. The manufacturers have devised various means to comply with the necessary 56-day updates for IFR, ranging from Foster's plug-in cartridge to Apollo and RNAV's replaceable EEPROM chips. Update costs run around $75 each. What about our personal library of user-defined waypoints? Are they a lot of trouble to program? Not really. You can enter them while you're on the ground using published latitude longitude information. Or while you're flying, put them into memory with the present position button found on most receivers. Some receivers, such as Texas Instruments TI-9200, RNAV's R21, and Apollo 612B allow you to enter waypoints by range and radial from any other point already stored in the memory. One of the more exciting uses of all this stored away data comes along when you have an in-flight emergency. Listen as tomorrow's Larry Stearns explains their emergency search feature. If we are en route and there develops some sort of problem where we want to get to the ground in a hurry, push the two buttons that are outlined in red simultaneously and it displays emergency search. Then it shows you the nearest airport and how to get there from your present position. If the emergency should disappear, or if you want to resume your original course, repeat the process, and the course information that you had before returns with it updated. The unit actually has two search features. It can direct you to the nearest airport, or it can direct you to a nearby waypoint you've entered previously. That's called the private search capability. If you fly a regular route, say for example a bank paper run, or trips to your company's outlying plants, you can pick out emergency landing sites along the way. 
Just press the present position button as you pass over open fields, unlighted airports, dry riverbeds, any site where you can put down in an emergency. Then, if you have an actual emergency, just press the red line buttons and it will give you range and radial to the nearest landing site, even if it's disguised by fog or darkness. Our nav and Apollo have built in a few more safety features. Both can be connected to fuel flow digitizers to give you accurate fuel range figures, interpolating actual consumption figures into ground speed. And both can be linked to special emergency locator transmitters. In fact, our nav will give you the exact location of your downed aircraft verbally with a voice synthesizer. Now that you've excited us about all these bells and whistles, what's it going to cost us? That's a good question. Prices vary greatly. Take the RNAV R21, for instance. You pay $3,195 and get as much navigational information, maybe more, than the guys in the corporate jets have. Something even more interesting is, as the receivers get better, the prices get lower. It's just like the situation with personal computers. Take the Apollo 612, for instance. It contains the standard Flybury software and retails for $3,795. The newer model 612B contains much improved Continental Flybury software and sells for $700 less at $3,095. Foster has just entered the general aviation market with its LNS 500 at $2,395. That's quite a drop from the $20,600 price of their LNS 616. Narco, a longtime manufacturer of traditional avionics, has just entered the Loran C field with one of the lowest price receivers of them all, the LRN820 at only $1,197. And this Terra Corporation, which got into Loran C by buying out SRD Laboratories. Their TLC100 is the low price leader at $1,095, and their easier to use TLC120 is $1,695. By the way, if you already own an RNAV R40, you can have it updated with all the fancy new software for $700. But you should be aware that since the new software is not IFR certificated, you could no longer use your R40 in IFR conditions. If you're thinking about buying a Loran C, there are several more aspects you'll want to investigate. What about panel space? Can you accommodate the RNAV R40 at three and a quarter inches by six and a quarter inches? Or would you be better off with the Foster LNS 500 at two inches by six and a quarter inches? Do you need the full range IFR capability of the Foster LNS 616? Or will the RNAV R40 serve your purposes as long as you stay out of the fringe areas? Would you prefer a unit like the Apollo 612B whose extended range will allow you to fly VFR in the gap in other fringe areas? Do you want keyboards, knobs, or a combination of the two? Any way you look at it, Loran C is the new wave in general aviation navigation, the little black box that has brought the computer aids to our cockpits. Al? Thanks, Bill. In the two or three years since Loran C receivers appeared on the general aviation market, they've created a minor avionics revolution. While more sophisticated technology looms on the distant horizon, it looks like Loran C will continue to be a viable navigation device for at least the next 10 years. We're delighted that so many of you wrote to us after receiving your premier issue of Aileron. Our publisher, Dennis Holmes, has joined us to talk about some of the mail we've received. Dennis? Aileron is off the ground and flying. The flood of subscription orders we've received has been terrific. We thank you for your support and confidence. But what I really want to thank you for is this. Look at this. Thousands of you have cared enough about our new venture to tell us what you think, what you liked about the first issue, and what you didn't like. And I want you to know that your responses are helping us shape the editorial direction of this new type of magazine. I wish I could write a letter to every one of you individually, but I do want you to know that our entire top staff has read every comment and every suggestion that you've written. Now, what are the results? Well, Aileron's direction has been clarified in several key areas. First, while most of us aren't in the market for a Learjet or an F-16, it's still pretty interesting to see what it's like to fly one, and we're going to give you that type of exciting experience. Second, you've given us a clear mandate to look at real-world economical flying, evaluations of the airplanes and equipment that human beings like you and me can afford to fly and own. Third, 
Your strongest mandate is that you want articles on professional piloting techniques. You want a high level of aviation knowledge and you want information you can use right now. Our goal is to do just that. Articles with lasting value. We want you to save every issue of Aileron and enjoy viewing it next year just as much as today. Thank you again for your great support. Thank you, Dennis. The future for Aileron sounds as exciting as flying itself. How do you feel about Aileron? We invite your comments. Please address them to Aileron, the video magazine of aviation, 2016 Cotner Avenue, Los Angeles, California, 90025. If you're presently an Aileron subscriber, or you know of a friend who would like his own personal subscription, give us a call at the following toll-free numbers. 1-800-435-4447. If you live in California, dial 1-800-AILERON. As we mentioned earlier, if you would like an autographed first edition of Barry Schiff's new book, The Proficient Pilot, our operators will see that your order gets to the proper place. Our operators are on duty 8.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Pacific Time, Monday through Friday. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to fly one of America's best-known corporate symbols, the Goodyear blimp? Bill Cox had that opportunity. He's here to tell us about it. Bill, I know the blimp can be flown under VFR conditions. Can it be flown IFR? Yes, Al, it certainly can. As a matter of fact, Goodyear occasionally has uh, reasons to make IFR approaches. They like to avoid that whenever possible for one very good reason. When the aircraft is operated in visible moisture, it tends to pick up weight. And, of course, buoyancy is very important in an airship, per se. And as a result, they try to avoid IFR conditions whenever possible. Fortunately, on the day that uh, we made our flight in the Goodyear Blimp Columbia, uh, we had perfect weather. If you have 192 feet of envelope out there and you get just a little bit of wind on the side, that's a big mass and it will take a lot to slow it down. If you picture a 200 foot sailboat flying, that's about what we're like. To me, it's, well, it's the most unique aircraft that I know of. The airship is one of the most safest modes of transportation. You can shut the engines off, kick some ballast out, you'd be in a state of free balloon. You'd go with the wind. Goodyear's involvement with Lighter Than Air began in 1911. Our first chairman of the board, uh, P.W. Litchfield, saw some airships flying in France, decided at that point that Goodyear should be involved in uh, Lighter Than Air. The definition of dirigible is anything that's lighter than air, powered and steerable. A Zeppelin is a rigid airship and a blimp is non-rigid, but all of them fall under the category of being dirigibles. Uh, we started building the first airship, which was the Akron, then in 1925, built our first lighter-than-air ship using helium. And that's the same type of ship that you see flying today. The Goodyear Blimp Columbia sports a 23-man support organization, and the chief mechanic truly has a king-sized job. The chief mechanic is responsible for all of the maintenance on the airship. We have to fall under the rules of the FAA 
and all the mechanics are licensed, electronic technicians are licensed. Our inspections, which are the 50-hour, 100-hour, and daily inspections, are just like any light twin aircraft. The ship is powered by a pair of Continental IO 360s. Uh, they put out 210 horsepower each. For those of you familiar with the old Cessna Mixmaster, it's the same engine power plant. Uh, we have Hartzell Q-tip props on board. We can get uh, 23 inches of manifold pressure and uh, 2,300 RPM in reverse. That's about 70% of our normal power in reverse. The blimp's bag or envelope is an impressive 193 feet long and 55 feet in diameter, all of it neoprene-coated two-ply Dacron fabric. A normal envelope lasts 10 to 12 years before weathering and normal wear and tear forces replacement. The early airships and Zeppelins were literally 800 foot long bombs filled with highly volatile hydrogen. Today's blimps use inert helium to achieve their lighter than air buoyancy. Helium is a non-volatile gas so safe that it's often used in concentrated amounts as a fire extinguishing agent. The airship's main flight characteristic is it is being lifted by the helium and what we're literally doing is we're taking about 180,000 cubic feet of helium and displacing 180,000 cubic feet of air. Now if we could grab that air up in a bag and weigh it, it would weigh out at about 12,000 pounds. So that's where we get our lift. We get about 12,000 pounds of lift from the helium. Each of the four Goodyear blimps has a complement of five full-time pilots, but takeoff and landing wouldn't be possible without the help of ground handlers. There's 16 ground crew, uh, which consist of technicians, riggers, uh, mechanics, ground handlers. Everybody does their job, and then, of course, everyone is responsible for the landing and takeoff of the airship. Launching a gray whale into the sky is a team effort that's tougher than it looks. The crewman bounce the blimp on its one stiffly sprung main gear to get it clear of the ground before the pilot adds full power for climb. If the blimp had a wing, angle of attack during climb would reach 35 degrees or more. Unlike most airplanes, the blimp does virtually everything at the same speed, 35 knots. Predictably, such high pitch attitudes and low speed generate spectacular rates of climb, in this case over 1,500 feet per minute. This particular aircraft requires flying by feel, which is anathema to anybody that's taught uh, a, a normal training syllabus because you're supposed to fly by instruments, you're supposed to fly by the book, you're supposed to fly by numbers, but you're not supposed to fly by feel. Blimps are not that way. You have to fly them by feel. So whereas academically you have our systems down to maybe 20 hours, uh, realistically you don't feel comfortable until you have about 500. I got the feel of the blimp with Goodyear pilot John Creighton in the right seat to make sure I didn't break anything. I noticed you have a tremendous amount of uh, delay, the tendency to over control on both uh, yaw and pitch on the machine. That's something you have to get used to. That's why this aircraft is not easily learned. It takes a long time to get the feel for it. There's a tendency to porpoise on the machine. You pitch it down, as we're doing now. First of all, the big wheel right here is your elevator trap. Usually you pitch up, pitch down, pitch up. Let's see if I can get it back to level here. There's nose well below the horizon and coming back up. Then you just wait. You have to learn is you can't be too fast in the elevator. It doesn't respond the way it would in an airplane. I see. Think about it more like a tiller on a sailboat to get a feel for how to put the inputs in. Put an input in, you wait for it to respond, and then start putting the out direction back in. Blimps fly by buoyancy rather than aerodynamic lift and utilize a ballonet system inside the airbag. Two pleated air chambers at the front and rear of the envelope serve as the airship's pitch trim system in two ways. Air is heavier than helium, so adding air to one ballonet makes that compartment heavy. Also, when you pump air into only one ballonet, the pleats expand and displace the helium to the opposite end, causing it to rise. A pair of scoops mounted behind the props gather ram air for the two ballonet, and the pilot has a valve panel overhead that lets him control the air intakes. He can trim the blimp nose up by adding air to the aft ballonet or nose down by adding it to the forward ballonet. 
Collectively, the helium, the ballonet scoop intakes, and valve exhausts give the aircraft a ceiling of about 10,000 feet, depending upon temperature, atmospheric pressure, and weight. Flying the blimp is certainly a different experience. It's also an exercise in over-control. The huge elevator and rudder at the rear of the airship take quite a while to generate an attitude change, and it takes a pilot some time to anticipate the lead and lag in pitch and yaw response. Fortunately, nothing happens very fast in a blimp, so it's hard to get into trouble. Okay, John, give me some kind of a description of the function of each of the instruments on the aircraft. Okay, basically, up in here we have the mid kilometer, which tells us the degrees of pitch. The very instrument flying at top of the building. Also, we have the gyrus and compass here, which is uh, RMI, basically. What we have here is our pressure devices, which tell us the thermometers, which tell us what the pressure of the gases is inside the envelope are. The helium gas pressure is what here tells us what the pressure of the air and aerosol are. Okay, and here we have the foreign department. Right in here we have our navigation equipment. We have two PORs, both with ILS capabilities, and our marker beacons up here. And these instruments across here are strictly only airship instruments. You'll never find these in anything else but an airship. One of them is the manometer, mechanical manometer, which averages all three of these over here we just talked about. And this here is the helium temperature gauge. This tells us what the outside air temperature is right now, which is 78 degrees. Helium is sitting at 80, uh, 92 degrees, so there's always a positive differential during the daylight hours. Up in here we have the fuel system. We have three tanks on board. We have a left, a reserve, and a right. When Goodyear takes the blimp on the road, as they do about six months a year, they install extra fuel tanks that allow carrying up to 24 hours of fuel. At only 30 knots, though, that's about 750 nautical miles. The crew travels by bus on the interstates and often arrives in plenty of time for dinner and a swim before the Columbia appears overhead. The blue handles are something unusual you won't find in many aircraft. 112,500 pounds, and that's the reversing numbers. All those great props all the way forward. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll do it. Okay. We can do this in the air, too. A lot of airplanes can't do that. Bring the pitch all the way forward. Bring the controls back to the neutral position. Hold back on this handle, then you can lift up on this, and hold that down, and then you've got the power left. Our cruising speed's 35 knots, about the taxi speed of most anything else that flies. So when we get a 10 knot wind, if we're going cross country and that wind's on our nose, that's 33 and a third percent of our cruising speed, with just a 10 knot wind. So that knocks us down to 25 knots ground speed. You turn around and put that wind on the tail, that pumps us up to 45 knots. So we can go from 25 knots ground speed to 45 knot ground speed by just putting that wind either on the tail or the nose. I doubt that the, even at a 50 knot wind and underneath some of the thunder showers that we've been caught by, that we've had more than a half G exerted on the airship. It'll do with the uh, Dutch roll. All oh, you pilots are familiar with a Dutch roll. It'll do a Dutch roll in slow motion. It's the best way to describe it. The worst I can give you for a war story would be maybe a 30-degree roll, which in an airship is significant, an airplane it's nothing. So we ride out weather very well. Goodyear spends about $2 million a year on each one of their airships. We break that down to about $700 an hour when you consider that the crews travel from 150 to 200 days a year. We have to be totally self-sufficient and we've got a 22-man uh, MCI bus, we've got a tractor-trailer unit, and a van that all travel with the airship when we go on the road. When the ship comes in for landing, we bring the crew out, and we line them up in order to show the pilot which way the wind's blowing. Our hardest operating condition day to day is a no-wind condition. If you have a no-wind condition, you have to come in probably at 10 to 15 miles an hour go into reverse, and the crew probably uh, makes contact with you at about five or six miles an hour. But again, uh, we're 12,000 pounds of mass. When we come in for a landing, we come in and flare. We have approximately 12 to 16 ground crew personnel out in front of the ship to stop it, but there's no way 16 people is going to stop 12,000 pounds without a little help. So we do go into reverse.
A mooring mast is an absolute necessity for a blimp, and the Columbia carries its own mast everywhere the aircraft goes. It's necessary to mast the blimp in order to do any major loading job, such as putting aboard the computer system for the super skytacular night sign. Part of my job is riding along on the night signs to take care of the computer on board. The uh, signs on the bag consist of 7,560 colored lights connected by 88 miles of wire. Uh, the sign is 105 feet long and 25 feet high. We can type in uh, quite a few messages and run them at will on our uh, what's called a local copy unit. But most of the designing is all done on a mainframe computer in Akron, Ohio. They're transferred to a magnetic tape, a uh, three-quarter inch computer tape. That turns on the individual lights on the side of the bag in sequence. Something off in the distance, you never, you never dream you're going to be involved in something like that. It's just totally different than anything I've been involved with before. All of us have flown other types of aircraft, and uh, this one is so unique. She always teaches you something new. I have almost 7,000 hours in the airship itself and uh, I never fail to learn something every time I get in it. Uh, when you think you have it uh, absolutely wired, she turns around and teaches you something else. In 20 years of flying over 220 different types of aircraft, the Goodyear blimp is the most unusual machine I've ever flown. Bill, let me ask you something. When Goodyear does take the blimp across the United States, cross country, what do they do about refueling? I can't imagine them calling uh, Hanksville Unicom, asking for a landing advisory. It's the Goodyear blimp. It really shakes some people it up. Is, it is a little bit of a problem, Hal. Um, basically, they have to do a lot of uh, advanced planning for any trip they plan to take in the blimp. The range is only 350 nautical miles. When you stop and consider that's 10 hours flying for the pilots, uh, that it's quite a task for them to even cover that distance. Uh, they have a crew of 23 people who have to travel with the blimp, so they have to erect a mast at every destination, and all refueling stops or overnight stops require considerable amount of, uh, of effort on them. So actually they're only going about 35, 40 miles an hour, right? At the very most. Um, you can just imagine if they were shooting an IFR approach somewhere, an approach control coming on and saying, increase your approach speed to 40 knots. <laughs> it would be right. almost like flying a helicopter. You'd get there a little faster on the freeway, even at 55, right? That's right. But the view wouldn't be quite as spectacular. <laughs> I'm sure of that. Bill, that's an absolutely fascinating report. Thanks for bringing it to us. It was fun to shoot, Hal. Still to come in future Aileron issues, 0 to 160 in 4 seconds. Porsche Power takes to the air. Is Starship the future way to fly? And Skylane owners tell you about a better, the Cessna 182. As we acknowledge an aerial salute from the Goodyear blimp, we'd like to thank all of the people who worked so hard to put this edition together. And thanks to you, our subscribers, for your enthusiastic acceptance of this exciting new magazine concept. For all of us at Aileron, I'm Hal Fishman. Do fly safely. <laughs>